Hi, and welcome to Asian Agribiz Podcast. I am Arif Arudin. In this two-segment series, our editorial director, Connie Pereira, is speaking with J.Y. Cho, further discussing about Mr. Cho's feature article on our website entitled The Four Key Dimensions in Agri-Food Post-COVID-19. This segment addresses the first two key dimensions, namely digitalization and displacement. Mr. Cho is an agri-food advisor and financing expert who has over 18 years of experience in Asia-Pacific across operations, strategy, and banking. Much intrigued by how food tech and ag tech are reshaping our future, he is a firm believer in the power and responsibility of a positive impact on our food and agriculture. JY, in your recent article on the four key dimensions in agri-food post-COVID-19, you stated that COVID-19 is challenging the status quo of our food and agriculture system, and we have to reimagine the future of both. You also mentioned four fast emerging trends, digitalization, displacement, disruption, and sustainable development. We thought it would be a good idea to dive a little deeper and offer specific insights to our listeners. So let's address digitalization, which has seen immense traction in the months following March 2020. So how do you see digitalization reshaping sales and retailing models? Thank you, Connie. Well, first of all, I will say that these trends were in fact not new to us. Uh, it's just that COVID-19 crisis accelerated these trends. It's like bringing this future closer to us. And when you look at digitalizations, the pandemic won't last forever, but some new shopping habits for digital will stay. So you have to adapt. It is a matter of survival for your business, and it's probably the best way to future-proof for the future. You have to be omnichannel. So what does it mean for brick and mortar players? It's about building a direct-to-customer strategy, D2C, engaging for social media, and having alternative delivery or even multiple options. Of course, it's easy to say, but on the day-to-day business, it brings a lot of new challenges. I'm thinking of how to build your digital assets, like website, Facebook, Instagram, how to optimize your visibility with search engines, how to have user experience, how to run a social campaign, how to have real-time visibility across channels. For most of these questions, the answer would be data, data, and data, and of course, analytics. Okay, so what impact is this having on the labor landscape in farming and food service, and what can drive us in this seat expect in the future? Yes, on top of the digitalizations, we have the robotizations. During the pandemic, farmers and producers face labor shortage. For instance, the slaughterhouses shut down because of outbreaks among the staff. And because of these bottlenecks, growers have to deal with the hares and flocks and suffer losses. So automations will accelerate across our entire food system in farming, slaughterhouses, processing plants, and restaurant chain. On the farming side, All this new technology will have an impact on labor, for sure. It may be open also opportunities to farm in some very remote areas as well. For fast food, very soon, we won't see anyone flipping your burger's body, for example. We also mean more semi-prepared product for food service as well. I also want to mention another trend, which is uh, e-commerce, the automated solution for vending machine. We can imagine a future where your pizza will arrive at your doorstep and that have been freshly baked by a robot that actually was commuting uh, down to your place. And that that makes you think the whole strategy of of, uh, your notion of uh, geography. 
but you think that not only consumers will be on the go, but you can also have an on the go supply, which is very interesting. Okay, and what are some omnichannel models that have been successful? Well, for successful omnichannels, I would say there's many cases, right? Um, the food service chains that create greater user experience with mobile apps uh, and reward programs are a good example. Uh, first of all, it allows the players to keep your margin in-house instead of uh, considering a 20 or 30 percent cut for uh, some delivery apps. But it also increase uh, your customer base and allow further reiterations of business. So this is very important, right? Um, we've seen some interesting collaborations uh, between retailers, restaurants, and uh, sort of driving navigation apps. And that makes sense. Right now, in, in that pandemic, uh, the usage of car has been uh, more intense and uh, putting direct advertisements uh, with geolocations uh, is another way to have uh, more tractions in your business in a very targeted way. Right? But I also want to praise the mid-size entrepreneurs, uh, those who have pivoted really well during that crisis. Uh, to name one, there's a company in Hong Kong called uh, MNC Asia. They distribute premium seafood to high-end uh, restaurants. And, and during that crisis, they have to shift. So they offset part of a business uh, through direct sales by selling to local committees. And that was done using Facebooks, and Instagrams, and other uh, medium like that. Yeah, actually, I did see a lot of traction there with food service where people, you know, changed very fast to delivery models as well. And they even upped the ante on that with, uh, by offering, you know, sometimes Michelin star meals, sometimes cooking for people at home, so many different ways of uh, re-engineering themselves. But uh, going forward, how can shop streaming for meat products be viable and successful? Yeah, it's really good questions about uh, how the future of shop streaming will, will be relevant for our meat industry. Um, my short answer, answer is I don't know, but it's really worth to explore. Um, I was observing how uh, live streaming has become so popular, especially in China. I was reading some news that even some farmers in second tier cities in China were getting tractions. Uh, to the point that even Chinese authorities were supporting this movement and improving the internet infrastructure to support that. And I think when you think deeply of, of how live streaming is, is um, sort of bringing authenticities and a different rapport that you can build with your product and a level of engagement uh, for, for your consumers, this is really something worth to explore. And especially if you're a family business, it may be a way to, you know, to um, show a stronger identity beyond your label, uh, telling the history of your business, which can be very important when, uh, again, consumers are looking to get closer to the uh, what's behind the product. Okay, now let's move on to the second dimension in agri-food post-COVID-19. You mentioned displacement as moving something from its original location or setting the shortest route from a point A to point B. Now, this relates to the supply chain. How do you think COVID-19 has recalibrated supply chain models? Yes, Connie, I think the COVID-19 direct impact in supply chains uh, has two immediate changes. One is uh, the just-in-case, and the second one is about optionalities. So because of the uncertainties of supply, we move from a strategy of just in time to just in case. So importing countries increase their strategic reserve, feed players and integrators uh, pass additional orders to avoid shortage, and even consumers had panic buying. So this may not increase demand, but build pockets of buffer uh, along uh, our value chain. And by the way, it created some needed for uh, capital or working capital, I would say. And talking about optionality, it is mainly through alternative sourcing. So it's about how you want to define 
procurement strategy. And I know it's very difficult when you want to be cost sensitive, but it's something really important to uh, plan. I know that corporates had some long discussions with us, uh, the sourcing managers on how much extra cost, or I would say premium, you are willing to pay or allocate to have these optionalities. This is very important questions nowadays uh, going forward. Uh, trends that I just mentioned, which just in case and option optionalities, I think for me it's just scratching the surface. I think it comes again to the most essential questions in our industries is, are we moving the right things in the right way? Right. Uh, so you do, from what you've said, it is obvious that there have been paradigm shifts. So what paradigm shifts do you see in farming and processing, particularly in Asia? Well, Connie, I think the prime shift, it, it's something that um, uh, the question was there. I mean, the challenge is known. We have to feed 10 billion people by 2050 and probably using half of the resource we're using today. And for Asia, it's even a more pressing issue, given our protein gap that we're having. So, of course, the growing middle class is driving the demand for meat, and we have to, to deal with that. But I believe that producing animal protein is not the only solutions. We will need a combination of animal farming and uh, alternative protein. But also, for me, it's about efficiency, uh, an efficiency on the way to convert our precious resource and reducing wastage as well. Uh, JY, I think this whole pandemic has laid focus on food security, which has emerged as a red flag with self-sufficiency at the top. How does a short food circuit and circular economy work? Yes, Connie, it is difficult to explain how it works because I believe there's a lot of different models. But let me give you some concept. And I will start with a uh, short food circuit. So the short food circuit is really a question of how to uh, shorten the length of the supply, basically, right? So it can be uh, consumer driven. For example, in Europe, we see customers uh, choosing to consume locally produced food. And uh, they lean towards seasonal supply to reduce for uh, the carbon footprint as well. But it can also be driven by redesigning supply closer to demand, especially with uh, projects such as indoor farming or what we call the urban vertical farming. We can think, of course, of greenhouses with LED lights, but I think uh, RAS, Recirculate Aquaculture System, is most interesting for our feed and protein sectors. When you think about having a fully controlled farm of salmon or shrimp able to deliver fresh sashimi grade products near your cities, for me, it totally makes sense. And about circular economy, it's all about closing the loop for me. How to turn a waste into an input. Of course, you probably heard of uh, insect protein, which is uh, using yes. either some uh, wheat byproduct or food waste. Mm -hmm. But also, we can think of how meat and bone meal can have a better value in terms of utilizations or how the digestibility can be improved using some new technology. Yeah, so when you talk about vertical farming, uh, RAS and urban farming, do you think in a country like Singapore, this has been addressed, but will it address self-sufficiency? Yeah, it's very interesting. I think Singapore uh, has a very clear agenda in terms of self-sufficiency. They probably would not be 100% uh, self-sufficient, but they definitely have uh, really uh, great ambitions and they are committed to that. So they put in place uh, what they call the plan to have 30 by 30 program. So it's about producing 30% of uh, its nutritional needs mm -hmm. by 2030. Today is only 10%. So this is a vast program and uh, it's mainly about uh, fruit, which will be 20%, uh, fruit and vegetables, and 10% from proteins, mainly egg, fish. But alternative protein will have a big play into that as well. Connie, you may ask me if, how they're gonna do that. Well, um, I really believe that uh, Singapore has great resource and mm -hmm. 
they will use some uh, push and pull mechanism. Mm -hmm. On the push side, it will be about R&D and innovations, but also uh, supporting pro project with some express grants, uh, for instance, for vertical farming that they are doing already. Yeah. And on the pool side, uh, the government has uh, great communication and transparency with the population. So it will be about raising awareness about mm -hmm. existing of uh, local uh, homegrown produce and uh, explaining more about the benefits uh, that we can have for the country. Yeah, that's interesting, JY. Uh, so finally, JY, what constitutes a sharing economy that mutualizes resources? Well, I think today it's, it's a concept that we start seeing maturing. Uh, we see some projects and I think it's only the beginning, right? I was, I was mentioning that probably uh, the next unicorn in, in the business may, uh, may be a sort of a Airbnb or Uber in, in agri-farming, which is mm. possible. It's about how you can mutualize some resource. Uh, I'm thinking of, of agricultural land, machinery and know-how. So, when you think of his ideas, uh, you can see how, how uh, a sort of a more collaborative efforts or sort of a cooperative structures, uh, right. which is supported by uh, digital solutions, really elevates the progress into farming, right? So it's really worth the developments. I think, uh, for instance, for heavy machineries, uh, mm -hmm. it's something that it really makes sense because it's a very expensive uh, capex and it makes sense to uh, mutualize it, for instance. Yeah, I think that is what is being pushed in Vietnam with ASF. You know, with all the smaller farms, they're trying to corporatize them so that they have uh, mutual benefits with farming and biosecurity and the proper farming methods. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would support a cooperative push as well. So, uh, JY, thank you very much for talking about digitalization and displacement. In our next segment, we will address disruption and sustainability as well. Digitalization and automation will deeply change our sales channels and labor market. Displacement, meanwhile, will be redesigning farming, processing, and trading models. We hope you found this first segment useful. You can download it on www.asian-agribees.com. Thank you for joining us and watch this space for the next segment that will address the other two key dimensions, namely disruptions and sustainable development. <music>